Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm David Feldman. I'm the uh, director of the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism here at Birkbeck. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this lecture, which takes place not only um, um, under the um, banner of the Pears Institute, but also as part of Arts Week here, organised by the School of Arts at Birkbeck, and I hope this will be the first um, of many such collaborations. It would be possible for me to take between now and about 20 past seven, introducing George Steiner, such is his immense stature as an intellectual and as a critic, and such is the volume and the range of his writings. You'll be pleased to hear that I intend to be a bit briefer than that. George Steiner is, among other things, what's called an extraordinary fellow at Churchill College in Cambridge. And never, I think, has that title of extraordinary fellow ever been better used. Of course, he has also gleaned many other honours, not only from the British Academy, but from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, from the Royal Belgian Academy, and from France, where he has been awarded the a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur. He is a towering figure, one who has shaped the study of comparative literature over the last half century. As this might suggest, George Steiner is that very rare thing in these islands, a truly European intellectual. European in the sense that his work spans and combines criticism and philosophy in ways which are perhaps un-English. And European in the sense that he has taken European high culture from the ancients to the moderns as his field with work on tragedy or on language and translation and most recently in the poetry of thought on style, all marked by extraordinary erudition, urgency, and insight. I will only give the briefest nod here towards the um, several volumes of essays, memoirs, and the fiction, including the extraordinary and shocking novella, The, the um, a portage to, uh, to San Cristobal of A.H. I do so because I want to highlight one further singularity. George Steiner writes within a humanist tradition in controversial ways that sometimes place him as someone who is heterodox, even as a heretic. Seen in this light, we might imagine for a moment that we could pigeon him whole uh, that we could pigeonhole him as a non-Jewish Jew, to use Isaac Deutscher's famous phrase. But unlike Deutscher's non-Jewish Jews, men such as Marx and Trotsky, George Steiner's work has been punctuated by a recurrent commitment to examine Jewry and its relationship to European culture from its most terrible to its most celebrated moments. It is a great pleasure and a great honour to introduce uh, George Steiner, who will talk to us about Homeland. The pleasure and the honour are mine. When it was announced that I was to be made extraordinary fellow, my daughter, very little girl at the time, now a fearfully distinguished academic in New York at Columbia, stood in the kitchen in her pyjamas very thoughtfully and suddenly said, I know what it means to be an extraordinary fellow. It means to be more ordinary than before. And that was, <laughs> that was very true. The tensions, the enmities are there from the start. Priesthood and prophecy are in an unforgiving conflict at the roots and hearts of Judaism. This conflict found figurative expression in the struggle between the city and the desert, as set out fantastically in Amos. Think for a moment of the modern analogy, which would be Pol Pot's tactics in Vietnam, in Cambodia, 
and the Sentiero Luminoso in Latin America. The vengeance of the desert, the vengeance of the land against a corrupt city. It's a recurrent moving. Numbingly, the scriptures proclaim that Jerusalem will always kill its prophets. That is not a non-Jewish observation. It's a Jewish observation. Jerusalem will always kill its prophets. The possible analogy with Athens' killing of Socrates has haunted the Western imagination. The Athens-Jerusalem analogy in respect to these two homicidal, murderous impulses. As you know, the Torah prohibits any exploration or divination of the future that is strictly forbidden. To foretell the future is to impinge on the license of God's omnipotence. It is, in a sense, to abrogate the total freedom of God's will, his liberty to alter his intent. Inevitably, moreover, black arts, occult techniques, and witchcraft attach to prognostication. Hence, the utterly spellbinding narrative of the old woman at Endor, who is no less of a witch than other weird sisters in Macbeth. You remember at the end of that narrative, we have nothing, I think, in world literature that surpasses that chapter in the book of Samuel. The Hebrew is entirely simple, three words. Saul now knowing he will die the next day and that his son Jonathan will be killed in the battle with him. And all that the scripture says is, they walked into the night. They walked into the night. Saul and his two companions walk away from the cave of the witch of Endor and walk into the night. The priestly establishment, the temple clerisy, are in essence anti-messianic. They've always been anti-messianic. Their energies, their alliance with the politics in power, aim at the preservation of the status quo. Ritual, liturgy, the halachic code are by virtual definition conservative. They have to be to be true to their own genius. Incessant repetition is a primary instrument of political social stasis and enforcement. The almost hypnotic rites of constant repetition in Hebrew prayer, in front of the wall or in the synagogue or in the shul. These techniques would bring time to a halt. The synagogue rites and pronouncements operates in an eternal present, that eternal present which is crucial to Hebrew grammar and which makes it so very difficult for Indo-Germanic other languages to cope with the sense of time in Hebrew narrative. Prophecy, on the other hand, exploits the grammatical an ontological scandal, I'm using scandal in the Greek sense, skandalon, of the future tense. Man's enigmatic but life-giving capacity to speak of tomorrow. I don't think we pause enough to realize what a scandal that is, what a fantastic venture it is to speak of tomorrow, to speak of the Monday after one's own funeral, to speak of a million or a billion years from now, exact cosmological constants and configurations can be discussed. Events wholly beyond our own hopes, our own knowledge, and hope is itself a semantic function of the future tense. All hope 
is a function of the future tense. The instrumental paradox is this. The Hebrew prophets often, almost incessantly, predict disaster, chastisement, the possible extinction of Israel. At the same time, their prediction is utopian. This is a great paradox. It postulates the possibility, indeed the realization, of the messianic. Prophecy enlists the dynamics of transformative time of revolution. Hence a formidable inheritance in secularization of Judaic prophecy, of its futuristic rhetoric, futuristic in the proper sense of the word. In Marxist socialism, indeed in all utopian socialism, to prophesize, to exercise a radical critique of the established present. The prophet always stands to the left of the priest. And in the infinitely complicated relationship between Trotsky and Stalin, this is completely crystallized. Stalin's loathing of Trotsky's prophecies of Trotsky's so deeply Jewish messianic outlook. Stalin, the priest, the arch-conservative. The prophet stands to the left of the priest. This polarity, this configuration, ancient as Samuel's descent from Saul, ancient as the slaying of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is killed as both traitor and heretic. The priests pronounce Jeremiah both traitor and heretic, are reflected, are deeply mirrored in today's tensions between Israel and the diaspora. It is these I want to consider very briefly tonight. Zionism is compounded of manifold, often inconsistent, indeed self-contradictory strands. Ahad Am's visionary utopia was not that of Leibniz. Jabotinsky's militant, racist program out of the gangs of Odessa differs from the moderate pragmatism of Heim Weizmann. The initiating mainstream, articulated by Leon Pinsker and Theodor Herzl, was conceived in the image of Bismarckian nationalism, of Germany's unification and achievement of nationhood. This is the seminal irony. There is a profoundly ironic but inescapable concordance between Herzl's Judenstaat, Judenstaat and the reception of Emperor William on his white horse in full Prussian uniform at the gates of a reclaimed Jerusalem, being hailed by the Zionists as their savior and guarantor of national survival. It's almost inexhaustibly paradoxical. I won't ask how many in this distinguished audience have ever read the Judenstaat or Alt Neuland. Very few Jews have. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a very good thing. The Judenstaat is a manual of Prussian statehood of infinite pride in the nation as the answer to human needs, the nation as the militant principle in which individual virtues and qualities will be multiplied over and over and given their full resonance. There would be no Zionism without German political theory going back to Hegel 
and the fierce anti-Semitism of Fichte, whom Herzl admired. And only if you read that prose can you quite grasp the ironies. A curious footnote. We know from Herzl's diary, and we know, of course, from the day-by-day -day records of Richard Wagner's work, and we know, alas, too much about the young Hitler in Vienna. There's an early opera of Wagner called Rienzi with a thundering chorus, enormous, which goes heil, 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 over and over. The young Hitler, up in the standing room of the Vienna Opera, he went every night, on, though he was literally starving, says hearing that chorus, he had the revelation of his future policy and message. Heil, heil, heil. What does Herzl tell us? Listening to that same chorus, he had the revelation of Zionism. The revelation of Zionism. The great choir marching towards the future of the nation. Makes one rather troubled. The same music, the same notes, two rather different listeners. But the fundamental and internal contradiction lies deeper. The justification for a Jewish homecoming to Palestine, for the re-establishment of Eretz Israel, is that of God's promise to Abraham and God's commission to Moses. It is quintessentially theological, as Spinoza saw, and fiercely opposed. The Jewish claim to the appropriation of Israel derives from a textual revelation from the authority of the divine word as it is recorded in the Torah. The religious Zionist invokes a sacred legitimacy. But what of the secular Jew? What of the non-religious Jew? Presumably a vast majority. How dare he? play the Abrahamic card. What kind of deep hypocrisy is there in the Zionist claim to a right to Israel if you don't believe in the Abrahamic revelation, if you don't take God's word to be God's word? There is there a gap, an immense gap, how can the non-believing Jew invoke what he manifestly knows to be archaic myths, opaque narratives, millennial legends? For the rationalist or agnostic Jew, the foundational claims of Zionism are saturated with expediency, political expediency with intellectual hypocrisy. Abrahamic contracts with God are fictions. Bushes do not burn for the agnostic or secular Jew. Bushes do not burn. Add to this the refusal of the Orthodox to acknowledge the state of Israel, arguing that the absence of any messianic coming derives it of legitimate proof. This abstention now exercises a contemptible blackmail on social or political life in Israel. As you know, it's only in the last few weeks that Netanyahu says he will try and tackle this cancer in the body of Israel. I wish him luck. People who have seen a mob of Orthodox howling, and they howl. They howl 
as loud as any Islamic fundamentalist mob. They are a mob, a terrifying mob. If he thinks that he can make them serve in the army or accept Jewish civic law, good luck and blessings to him. Gershon Scholem, whom I had the honor, infinite honor of counting as a skeptical older friend, used to say, the Palestinians are no problem at all. The Orthodox will destroy us. And that was Gershon Scholem, one of the wisest men in the history of modern Judaism. The Orthodox fanatic disdain for military service, the men spitting at young children, I've seen it, because they are offended by their dress, their search towards censorship of public speech, mocks, puts in doubt the whole of the Zionist enterprise, which was meant to be a liberal enterprise. These contradictions, this unresolved duplicity at the core, have made of today's Israel a sad miracle. A sad miracle. A miracle, nevertheless. The achievements have been immense. An orphan barren land has been made to flourish. The standards of economic life towers over that of the rest of the Middle East. Jews of entirely different origins, ethnic legacies, linguistic background have been more or less integrated, with exceptions, of course, with exceptions such as the refusal of the Russian community really to integrate up to now. In terms of medical care, Israel may be the envy of other nations. Scientific inquiry, artistic pursuits, educational possibilities, advanced study, unknown to Islamic communities, and these are secure in Israel. And all of these have been accomplished in the midst of constant struggle for military and economic survival, in the face of genocidal hatred, international his hostility or indifference, and loudly voiced threats of extinction, such as are now continually proffered by the mullahs in the surrounding countries. And it is worth noting that for Israel, the so-called Arab Spring is a bitter winter, is a bitter winter. Whether we like it or not, Assad of Syria kept his word on the Golan Heights. Golan Heights were secure under Assad's rule. Egypt, whether we like it or not, did observe its peace treaty with it. That will soon cease. Utter cretinery, I use this rude word, the backing for these so-called democratic movements. They are no more democratic than their opponents. And of course, Islamic fundamentalism, the Islamic Brotherhood is committed to the destruction of Israel. The price has been steep. An often raucous chauvinism marks many aspects of Israeli political and cultural life. An elite of the most gifted, particularly among the young, find it increasingly difficult to pursue their hopes in midst of a claustrophobic, even xenophobic climate of existence. They are striving to get out. The best are trying to leave. This is a terrifying truth. There is not an American university that is not deluged with applicants from the best of Israel's scientists. They feel that the national product and budget towards military needs, the execrable wall around Jerusalem, 
the intractable problem of the West Bank settlement press on their daily life. But the overwhelming fact remains Jews now have a homeland. Alt Neuland was Herzl's famous phrase. Jews now have a homeland, a place of ultimate refuge in which Hebrew has been quickened back into dynamic reality. In the black light of the Shoah, the prophecy of Amos has been fulfilled. And I quote, they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall rebuild the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land and they shall never again be pulled out of their land. The great Amos prophecy. And Israel can say we have come as close as is humanly possible to fulfilling it. Only its condition per se defines the diaspora. What is there in common between, say, the bitterly impoverished Jew in Istanbul and the millionaire Russian Jew mafioso now buying up London, <laughs> between the Jewish Nobel laureates on the American campus and the observant Orthodox Jew in the virtual ghettos of Hackney or Williamsburg in New York, between the Jewish moguls of the entertainment industry and the largely assimilated young Jews of Sao Paulo or Johannesburg. Only the inheritance of survival and the potentiality of renewed menace can be seen as some unifying principle. This menace weighs on every Jew, whether he is aware of it or not. It extends from the actual physical violence, as in today's Hungary, where Jews are assailed on the streets of Budapest. It extends from that to a spectrum of social exclusions, condescensions, professional discriminations, which encompass the overt brutalities of Russia, as well as the unctions of distaste in upper-class London or Paris. In my long years in Cambridge, instead of saying he's a pretty objectionable Jew, they found a wonderful phrase. He's a continental savant. I like that. <laughs> I like that. But in compensation, the achievements of the diaspora have, most notably, since emancipation in the 19th century, been immense. Jews, men and women of Jewish provenance, have almost dominated certain branches of the exact and applied sciences of economic and social sort, of humanistic and scientific research. Such vital organs of liberal argument as the press, publishing, the mass media, have, notably in the United States, been shaped and energized by Jewish talents. I remember a wonderful moment. I was most junior of juniors at the Institute in Princeton, but you were allowed to listen. And Dr. Oppenheimer had summoned the permanent members um, to discuss an appointment, an important new appointment to a vacant chair, mathematical logic. And he listened to the various nominations and the dossiers, and his famous pipe finally burst out. Could somebody mention one non-Jew? <laughs> I shall never forget that. For Neumann was at that table, and Panofsky was at that table, and then you can just imagine uh, the wonderful way that remark drew attention to the glory of the Jewish achievement while saying, careful. If our age has been that of Marx and Freud and Einstein, it is also that of Woody Allen and Bob Dylan, almost equally. 
No other ethnic minority has a comparable record of invention and communication. None has done more to energize the fiscal, technological, and educative strengths of the developed world. There are now more Jews alive on the planet than there were prior to the Shoah, a fact which is, in the proper sense of the term, an enormity. It's, it's an enormity. It signals that packed with life, that unquestionable vitality, which has underwritten some four millennia of Jewish survival and which has incensed and exasperated those among whom the Jews have persisted. As I reached the end of my own life, having my whole life tried to understand the terrible hatred against Jews in nations where there are no Jews. Now, this is really interesting. The country which prints more copies of the Protocols of Zion than any other is Japan. They've never seen a Jew. The countries in which the Jews have been murdered almost to the last, Poland, they are burning with anti-Semitism. And when you ask yourself, is there any explanation in the name of God? As I reach the end of my road, I have the hunch that we've been here too long, that there is something in our vitality which enrages other peoples. God knows the Romans and the Greeks were pretty splendid, uh, and there are many other great peoples, and they're gone, gone. There are two left on earth, the Chinese and we. And it's a very strange fact. The only two ethnic groups which use certain formulas, prayers, linguistic forms over 4,000 years. This enigma of survival may, may, have climaxed in the monstrous logic of the Holocaust. Men who have been in the gulag, Jews who have been in the gulag, now buy London, now buy the yachts in the great harbors of Cannes. Never forget the picture, I hope you remember it, of Sharansky. Ten years, much of it in solitary, in Katorga, dancing across the bridge, mocking his KGB guards. There is in many Jews a mystery of unquenchable vitality. Some kind of, I call it, oh, it's only a metaphor, of secret understanding with life itself, saying I'm not giving up. On the contrary, I'm going to make a great thing of it. Just think, these bestial people, owners of every British football club, English, uh, owners of, of the Hyde Park mansions, many were in the gulag. Came out, is that all right? Now billionaires. Think of Silicon Valley. The young Jews are now worth $17 billion. Stanford, which is dominated by Jewish brilliance. Some kind of mystery of cancer of life which frightens and infuriates other people. No one can assess the depths of the scars of the pathologies which this singular history of overliving, of survival, has generated in Judaism through assimilation and intermarriage, and whether these are not preferable to the possibility of another spell of servitude and mass murder. On his deathbed, the eminent Jewish American philosopher, Sidney Hook, dictated to Norman Podhoritz at that time the rising star in commentary, a statement which cowardly, he said, cannot be published before my death. And it said, I'm summarizing, if I knew that my children would face an Auschwitz, 
I would either have wanted not to have children or to have them converted immediately to Christianity. And before one mocks such a statement, one must think of it and understand it. What is the punishment we are extending to our children by letting them be Jews? But the counterpoint has been, and that's really the core of what I would like you to forgive me for saying tonight. For more than 2,000 years, Jews in the diaspora, once the murderous tribes of the book of Joshua, it's a terrifying text. The who writes the Amalekites shall be made drawers of water. The children shall be killed of those who are vanquished by Joshua's troops. It's a terrifying one. That people, the people of Joshua, once the inventors of ideological massacre in regard to the Samaritans, sorry, Sumerians, it is expedition against Samaria, which is, so far as we know, and as historians tell me, the first instance of an ideological massacre. Unknown to the Greeks, you butcher other people to steal everything from them or to get their women or to get their beautiful cities, not because of an ideological disagreement, but you butcher the Sumerians on a question of textual interpretation. Now that people has over more than 2,000 years in the diaspora neither humiliated nor tortured any other human being. Neither humiliated nor tortured any other human being. This abstention may have sprung from political impotence. Fair enough, but that's not the issue. That's not the issue at all. What this fact defines is an, an aristocracy like no other. It's the highest nobility to which you can aspire as a human being. I don't care what the circumstances, if you torture another human being, you cease being a human being. Bottom line, sorry, non-negotiable. And this is as true for the torturer as for the tortured. We know what is going on in Israel. Israel has had to torture in order to survive. We'll come back in a moment. I know, I know. But not to have been able to torture another human being, not to humiliate them. Have you seen what goes on in the queues outside the wall? Do some. The systematic humiliation of the long queues of Arabs. Captivity in Israeli hands is among the most bestial known to the modern world. Those are not fantasies, they're facts. Now, in the diaspora, there could be none of this. This was the diaspora's supreme badge of honor. I know of no greater honor, of no greater privilege than not to have humiliated and tortured another human being. And that we were spared. Oh, terrible price, of course, of course. But a price, I think, almost worth paying. In order to survive, can I underline that ten times? I'm not an idiot. In order to survive, the state of Israel has had to resort to judicial torture, to extreme military vendettas, to the daily humiliation and often maltreatment of Palestinian Arabs. It has had no choice. I know that. It has had no choice. This has been, this is, the ineluctable price of nationhood. The diaspora has not been called upon to pay it. And that is, in the final analysis, its moral sovereignty. It is idle to speculate about future relations between Israel and the diaspora. Our attempts to foretell things 
are always based on a rear-view mirror. None of us has the necessary mental or psychological powers <coughs> to predict that future. The only certain being that these relations will be fraught. In Israel, the gap between liberal peace now movements and the harsh nationalism of official propaganda and policy is widening. It is not an Arab who killed Rabin. We did it. And that was perhaps the last great moment of hope. Common to both is the almost desperate desire to become like other peoples, to normalize Jewish history. This is common both to the Peace Now movement and to a good many militant Zionists. Let us be like other people. By contrast, there is within a diaspora, though often subconsciously, the ancient prophetic ideal of universality. There is the iconic motion of the Jew as a guest among men. A guest among men. Ancient Greek, the word xenos, means both stranger and guest. It's a very wonderful thing. There is the iconic motion of the Jew from land to land, and to be a guest among men is a difficult, often perilous art. It's terribly difficult. A guest must seek to leave his host dwelling a little richer, a little more resourceful, more humane than he found it. That, that's his main duty. When you are a guest, you must leave your host better than you found them. He must keep his bags packed, always, always. A Jew with less than five passports is an idiot, in my opinion. <laughs> you keep your bags packed and near the door, near the door. No city is not worth leaving when it turns unjust or inhuman. One leaves. No city should be clung to when it turns barbaric. The guest, the wanderer, will rejoice in the Nazi insult, Luftmensch. Luftmensch meaning, difficult to translate, a creature of the air, which in Nazism meant, of course, no roots. He's indeed open to the skies and the freedom of the winds. Think of the Chagall figures floating high above the roofs. Trees have roots and lightning will consume them. Men have legs. I regard that as an immense advance. The peregrine Jew intuits that men and women, women and men, must learn to be one another's guests as all of us are guests of life and of this ransacked planet. We didn't choose to come. We, didn't, we have nothing to do with, the, with our birth, when, where, who, what. We are guests of life. The peregrine Jew will understand the exacting lesson that we must learn to be guests of each other or we will perish. And our homeland in the diaspora is a text, it is a vision, both of which are inextinguishable. The Torah comes with us, pocket edition. We move on, we move on. My wife and I had the privilege of visiting and teaching in China. And what was called my office at the University of Beijing had an odor which I can't quite mention in polite society. The table had three legs 
and the typewriter half the keys were missing. And idiot that I am, I panicked. I really panicked. True story. Chinese student comes in. What is the reading list for your seminar? And I was at home, completely at home. I had students, job to do, a reading list. What the hell else did I want? And I was completely at home. Put me anywhere. In the last four weeks, it's a joy to come to David today. I've had the privilege of lecturing in French in Paris, in German in Berlin, and last week in Italian in Milan. And it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And the notion that that makes me a victim of rootlessness seems to me utter idiocy. Our homeland is that incomparable text and that vision of a possibility, possibility of the universal. Would the diaspora survive, forgive me for even asking the question, if Israel was to fail? Perhaps one shouldn't ask the question. Perhaps it's not a permissible question. As you know, that question is itself virtually taboo. And perhaps it should not be posed even in so distinguished and welcoming a milieu as this room this evening. There are those who contend that the ruin of Israel would be so drastic a psychic shock that Judaism itself would succumb, that we couldn't survive. Others, looking to the history of the Jews after their expulsion from Spain, 500 years, from their high civilization in Damascus or Salonika, above all, the rebound demographically after the Shoah, argue that Judaism would once again recover and survive, that it is not dependent on the nation state of Israel. But as I say, maybe we shouldn't ask. If we could, we must stop imagining such a possibility. We must hope against hope that no such challenge will arise. Insofar as he identifies himself or herself, herself, himself as a Jew, whether orthodox or reformed, whether a believer or an atheist or agnostic, each and every one of us must decide between Israel and the Galut, between Zionism and extraterritoriality. He must commit this choice to those forward dreams which we call our children. As contemptible, forgive me, as contemptible as were the parlor Stalinists who infected Western culture are the parlor Zionists, the people who preach the wonder of Israel but wouldn't go there under any circumstance. <laughs> Equally contemptible and highly analogous the one and only time I had the privilege of meeting Ben Gurion, he said, I don't care what you're talking about, I want your children. <laughs> it was that simple. It was that simple. Shut up and send me your children. So every Jew, man or woman, must decide either way. That this choice is possible at all after the millennia in Auschwitz is yet another perhaps miraculous chapter in a history whose wonders and agonies of continuity are comparable only, as I mentioned, to those of China. At the end of our trip, the Vice Minister of Culture gave one of those Chinese goodbye dinners. 
in which after every word they drink firewood. I mean, it, it's terrifying. And he said, the people who reported on your seminar, totally unashamed, don't, of course there were spies sitting there reporting on my seminar, <laughs> say they were rather different from Sir Christopher Bricks, from Roland Barthes, from Monsieur Sartre, and looked at me and I said, yes, minister, you and I belong to the only two peoples on earth who fear exogamic marriage, who prize the language in South America. I hadn't started my sentence before the minister rose and said to his colleagues, Professor Steiner is saying we must learn Hebrew. <laughs> the absolute ironic speed and brilliance of Chinese understanding of an illusion came home to me. Whatever our choice, voluntary or enforced, we must bear in mind and in heart the admonition of the Baal Shem. There are a few words by which I live every morning. The truth is always in exile. Thank you.